again for the Holy Sabbath day. And Father, I thank you for Pastor Ophel and the blessing he's been to so many people. And this morning I pray that your spirit would be poured out upon him. That the words he would speak would be for our edification and for our cor uh, correction, for our instruction, and to renew in our hearts the blessed hope. Father, we thank you again today that uh, he can be here, that we can be here together to worship. May our hearts be open to receive this message we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Howard was telling me last night that uh, when the people came to the meeting, and I can see how it would happen. You'd say, well, I want to go uh, hear Pastor O'Phil, whoever that is. And then you uh, come and you walk in the door and there's sort of this old looking guy sitting on the front row. And you think, oh brother, I think I've just messed up. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I want to go through that. This is obviously for senior citizens. <laughs> but uh, I've been uh, gray haired uh, most of my life. Uh, I started getting uh, gray when uh, I was in my 30s and I colored my hair for a long time, Brother Mason. Until, uh, I did, I did, I did, until I saw how men who color their hair look. Now women color their hair, I think that's just fine. But I've yet to see a man who colors his hair that it doesn't end up a little green and blue and orange. Have you noticed that? And uh, so I was doing that to try to just hide it, but you can't hide the truth. And uh, so I decided after I saw how funny it was looking that I just let it go. So I went to Africa on a long trip and I came back and then the people thought, oh brother, what happened to him over there in Africa? He must have been. <laughs> I've been this way ever since. And uh, that I have uh, four children and uh, they're in their upper 30s and early 40s and they're getting gray light, but they color their hair and everything. And I think that's nice. In fact, I've been suggesting that if you have uh, dark hair, that you color it white like mine. Because when you get white hair, you get smart. And it's just too bad. You, it takes so long to get smart because you, you go through a lot of grief. You wouldn't have to, see, unless you listen to us people that get white, got white hair. So if, if, if you don't want to dye your hair, at least take notes on what the white-haired people say because they can save you some trouble. And... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, when I hear uh, Pastor Howard introduce me as being retired, I just flinch to that. I, uh, I'll have traveled 100,000 miles this year preaching. Does that sound retired to you? It doesn't sound, I just, I don't work for the Florida Conference anymore. I, uh, I'm a freelance revivalist. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister for a long time. In fact, you know, I could ask this young man here on the front row, uh, where were you when I went into the ministry, brother? I went in more than 40 years ago. Where were you? He wasn't around. The stork was carrying him up there in the cyberspace and wondering where to drop him. But uh, some of us have been around a while. Uh, by the way, just let me say that I hope that uh, those who are visiting with us today will stay for the uh, vegetarian cuisine. Now, you notice I'm not gonna lower myself to say potluck. I think that sounds like a, like a Taco Bell. You know what I mean? Let's go to the Taco Bell, let's go to the potluck. You know, that sounds like, you know, just a, that sounds, you know, kind of just the, the basic. Now we could call a fellowship lunch, fellowship dinner, and that would sound more like uh, Olive Garden. You know, we could say <laughs> Olive Garden. But uh, when you say vegetarian cuisine, now you're talking about, you know, Anthony's or Chenou or some, some really a high place where you have to pay about $50 a plate. 
So we're going to have a vegetarian cuisine after, after we have the preaching today. And I want to tell you, I've been around a while, and you may disagree with me, but you can go out to Chenu or Anthony's or wherever you want. And to me, there's no better food in the world than what we're going to have in the, in, the, in the vegetarian cuisines. I'd rather eat, excuse me, I'm going to revert back. I'd rather eat at a church potluck than any place I can think of. I mean it, I'll tell you. And one thing I like particularly is potatoes. I want to tell you if an angel were to come down from heaven right now and were to say, Dick, the Lord has decided there can, he's going to take away all the food but one. And you get to choose just one. What's it going to be? I wouldn't have to say, let me think about that or pray about that or anything else. I'd just say, potatoes. <laughs> I'd say potatoes just right there. Because I can have potatoes 24-7, seven days a week, every day of my life. and just feel. Now, my wife's not that way. She's a rice person. And you know, we've been married for uh, uh, 45 years. In fact, we've been married for, yeah, 45 years. You don't want to forget that, though. You, can, oh, you, want to, you don't want to overstate it or understate it or you get in trouble. But uh, we've been married for 45 years. And you know, these days, when you say you've been married for 45 years, they want to give you a standing ovation. I don't think they ought to do that because didn't we promise till death do we part? Uh, give me the standing ovation when I drop dead, but I'm just doing my duty. <laughs> I'm just doing what I promised to do. Didn't you promise to do that? Then do it. Then do it. How's that? Anyway, uh, my wife, though, she's, in, she's a rice person. And there's no amount of counseling, of marital counseling. There's no amount of, 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 of negotiation or of give and take that can change that. She's rice and I'm potatoes. And uh, it's just that way. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. I'm going to, I'm going to get a little serious here. And that is, I have a sermon I preach called, Can We Find Unity in Diversity? And the answer is no. You see, my wife likes rice, I like potatoes. No amount of negotiation is going to change that. Our marriage has stuck together. Uh, we're united not uh, in diversity, but in spite of diversity. Understand that. You see, let's don't celebrate diversity. Let's recognize it, let's appreciate it, and let's protect it, but let's not celebrate it. Because what, you see, our differences are walls we can't climb. In other words, I can't meet you at the point of, of, of these young people here, look at these young people. You know, I don't know how young they are, I don't want to say that, I don't want to guess an age, probably about. I don't want to say 16, they'll get mad. If I, but if I say six, you know, 60, they'll get mad again. But they're probably in the high 20s they're pushing the, thir they're pushing the 30s. I think I'd be safe. They'd feel good. They'd feel like God's complimenting them if I said that. But there's no amount. I, I'm, I'm 65 and, and, and they're, they're 28. Huh? Uh, that's irreconcilable. So our unity is not in our ages. It's in spite of our ages. So what we want to do is to recognize differences, protect them, respect them, but let's be united in spite of our differences, not in our differences. Did you catch on to that? Uh, anyway, <coughs> the, uh, Mark was uh, uh, reading you this little thing he prepared. He kind of paraphrased that a little bit, but it was essentially the same because I suggested that when, when you come to church on Sabbath, that they should hand a, a, a blank piece of paper to everybody who comes and, and make sure they have a pencil or a pen. And then number one is write down what you hear the minister say that you've never heard before. Now the smart people leave that blank because they've heard everything. They know everything, so they never hear something they don't know. Number two is what thoughts did you think that you had never thought before? Smart people fill that out. Because smart people are thinking all the time. Smart people are thinking new thoughts. I know I've had an experience, and maybe you have too. You'd be sitting in church, and the preacher's preaching about one thing, and you get a thought that has nothing to do with what he just said. It was like he kicked it out. 
And then you say, that's what I, I, I got to write that down. You know, it's good to write down some things. Some things come through and they really solve problems. Stick it away because it can be good to you. I get sermon ideas just right out of the blue. And if I don't write it down, I can't remember it. I just, it goes away. Another thing you want to do, as the pastor said, on this piece of paper is, is you write down what you're going to do about it. Hey, are we wasting our time here today? Did we just come here because we had nothing else to do? I want to tell you, we come into the house of God to worship him, to sing together, to fellowship, but we come mostly to get our lives changed. This is what it's about. Really think about it now, that the, the, the we live in a hostile environment. You know, they're, they're talking a lot these days about the possibility of some kind of a bird flu or something, and they're doing something about it. They want to get ahead of it. But yet think about it, and, 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 and you may think I'm just too negative, but listen, I'm not blind and deaf and dumb. Our homes are falling apart, and we're not doing anything about it. I'm concerned about that. I think, I think that protecting your marriage uh, is as important as, as getting ready for the bird flu. Uh, because, because, you know, this sounds weird now. Uh, but as I said last night, if we happen to die between here and there, Jesus can resurrect us. But it's just a tragedy when a home falls apart. Because it's fall apart forever. Now you might say, Pastor O'Field, don't talk to me this way, man. You put me on a guilt trip. I'm on my third husband. And, uh, you, and, and you know, that could be. But, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to get you to look backward. You see, that's another thing about the Christian life. The Christian life is not about looking backward. It's about looking forward. You might have made all kinds of mistakes. You make your mistakes, so you made your mistake. But what's really dumb is to keep making it. You see, somewhere along the line in Christ, we got to say enough's enough. Forgetting the things which are behind, I press forward to the mark of the high calling of God. But we don't forget. We rub our nose in it. We keep doing it. And that's, the, that's where I got problems as your, as your grandpa and as your spiritual leader. I'm going to talk to you about that. Because I don't think that we ought to sit still for that. I think we ought to wake up and begin to fight back. They talk about drawing a line in the sand, good grief. Draw a line in the sand, fella. Keep your marriage together. Now, you mad at me for saying that? No, you, you, I got to say that. Hey, your doctor tries to keep you well. Your preacher is trying to keep, your, keep your, 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 your soul together to keep it right. Anyway, when you get to be my age, now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't have that trouble, man. You were born old. Let, 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 me just, let me just ask you can, you, can any of you here remember your grandma when she, was, when she wasn't old? Can you? No, she was born old. She must have been born old. Old grandma. We love grandma. She's old. And back in the old days, they looked older than they do now because they wore little buns. You remember that, folks? They wore the little buns and those little black shoes. Remember those? That... that, 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 that <laughs> <laughs> Grandma was that way, little bun and those little black shoes. The rest of you don't remember that. But anyway, anyway, Grandma was always old. And so when it came time for Grandma to go to sleep, we, you know, it, it, we missed her. But I want to tell you something <clears throat> in my life to tell you where I'm coming from. Though I can't remember Grandma when she was young, I can remember my dad when he was young. You ought to see my dad, man. He was big, and he was a good-looking guy. And my mama, you know, you know, there's now. I'm not just you know want to get talking about this, but my mama had black hair, so who doesn't? And blue eyes. You don't see that combination very often. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor had that, but not many people have black hair and blue eyes. I remember them when they were young, when they were vigorous and they were good-looking. And then I watched old age chew them up. And, and, and I, there's a blonde girl sitting over here. You know, I see you sitting there just looking at me. Let me tell you something, honey. Let me tell you something about you that you didn't know. I know this is going to shock you. In fact, you're, you're liable to have to, they'll have to just carry you out of here hysterical when I, when I say what I'm going to say. She looks at me. See, she's blonde. At least she colors it blonde. I don't know which it is. She's really blonde. But anyway... What you don't know is that you're old age positive. You know what that means? That means that if Jesus doesn't come, you're going to be like me or worse. 
You understand what I'm saying? Listen, have you ever noticed this, some of you? Have you been to convalescent homes? Uh, and have you seen the little prunes in there? You know what I'm talking about? Huh? And you think, oh, poor thing, she's always been that way. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Just look up on the, on the chest of drawers. See that picture there? Guess who that is? It's like this. Uh, in, in other words, I'm only telling you this. Is because, is because, is because I'm 65 and it's an incredible time of life, son. Uh, it's like being on top of a mountain. You can see both sides. I remember when I was like, you don't think I was like you. I remember when I was. I remember that. But now I can see not only what it was like there, but I can see the other side. And it's not a pretty sight. But we're all headed there. You're headed there. You see, this is why particularly, and I want to just talk to the women here for just a minute, particularly women have a problem. Excuse me, so do us men, but you have a problem we don't have. And that is from the time that a girl's this big, they talk about her being cute. Remember that? Isn't she cute? Isn't she pretty? And the fact you buy her these little socks that got the little frillies around and you turn them down, a little patent leather shoes. She's so pretty. There goes that word, pretty. And it's pretty, it's cute, it's pretty, it's cute. And then it's sexy. In other words, a woman has a disadvantage because she's seen as a thing, as a body. This is why I say, I say that one of the biggest, Mason, one of the most magnificent women's lib texts in the scripture is the one that says, let it not be the outward adorning. Huh? Because you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying to the sisters, he says, honey, I love you as a person, not as a body. And I can't think of a woman in her right mind, but that wants to be seen as a person. And that's why a woman that gets hung up on the way she looks is going to hang herself in the end. Because one day, you, you're going to be looking in the mirror. And you're going to say, what's wrong with my neck? I must have too tight a thing on, because it'll start the turkey neck on you. <laughs> have you noticed this, ladies, the turkey neck? Huh? This is one of the first signs you'll see, and around the lips. You start getting those lines around your lips, and then your eyes look like you're smiling all the time, and you're not. <laughs> That's hard on a woman. That's hard on a woman. Uh, for a man, he gets old. They say, man, isn't he distinguished? <laughs> right. But then they say it's all in your mind. Look in the mirror. It's not in your mind. <laughs> uh, my my father-in-law, my father-in-law was a good-looking guy. And he'd look in the mirror, and he told me, he said, Dick, I look, I say, what's happening? What's happening? Now, I, now, I'm just talking to you. I'm talking to you about real life. See, To me, and you'll disagree with me, my daddy used to say, Dick, it's not so much that the wages of sin is death, it's old age. It's the disgrace. How the way it wipes you out, it takes the beautiful and makes a prune out of it. It takes the strong and makes it weak. It takes the smart. And it's like President Reagan, he died a few years ago. He didn't know who he was. Even in the scripture, David, David, talk about man of God, right. He's so old, they have a woman sleeping with him to keep him warm and he doesn't even know she's there. Anyway, I'm only telling you this. Listen to what I'm about to say. I'm only telling you this because, listen, this, this life, I'm glad we were here, but if it isn't, if Jesus doesn't come, it was a bummer. It only gets worse. You see the sister here, we were talking this morning about this couple. Did you see this couple sitting over here? She's dressed in yellow, and he's got a yellow tie and a yellow shirt that looks good. 55 years they've been married. Now, don't give them a standing ovation. They're not done yet. Uh, they're, just, they're just doing what they promised they would do, right? But I want to tell you something. They had no idea. Remember when they were young, they stood in front of the minister. And he said, do you promise to love, honor, and cherish in sickness and in health for better, for worse? Oh, yeah, man, sure, right on, man. Let me get on the honeymoon, man. Uh, who was going to know? It was going to be a wheelchair, right? I didn't know that. How many of the church fellowship dinners have I been to where I see the man feeding the woman? She's got Alzheimer's. Or the woman there with the husband. He's had a stroke. Son, <laughs> you wish you didn't come today. You say, good grief. This is, this is for the senior citizens. No, it isn't. It's for you. Because you read Ecclesiastes 12. It says, remember your creator when you're young because the evil days come when this is what goes on eat you up. What I'm really saying is 
if Jesus, this story about the coming of Jesus isn't true, then this was a bummer. Because we're in, a, we're in a mess that we can't get out of. And you see, this brings up a question too, is that, is that why don't we hear about the coming of Jesus much anymore? I, it used to be that w when you went to a Seventh-day Adventist church, that's all they talked about. They talked about Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Talk about it all the time. Not so much anymore. You know, one day I, they asked me to do the Sabbath school lesson uh, at the Tacoma Park Church in Maryland. I used to belong to that church. And, and it had classes like we have here today, but that day they were going to do just one class. They asked me to give it. And that particular quarter, it was about last day events. And that particular Sabbath, it was about the coming of Jesus. And I thought to myself, Oh, brother, what am I going to do? What can I tell the people they don't already know? They already know about it. They're just going to be bored. I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a questionnaire. Like I remember I was telling you about, like I, I like to ask questions. But by the way, listen to what I'm about to say now. Write this down. Remember I told you during Sabbath school, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond. Write this one down. He who asks the questions, huh, controls the agenda. Be careful of someone who asks questions. There are questions that have only wrong answers. Uh, the biggest mistake that was ever made is when that snake asked Eve, uh, she should have hit the road. Uh, she should, because, because he was controlling the agenda. She should have said, uh-oh, something's wrong here, I'm out of here. Watch out for this, and by the way, there are questions, as I said, who have only wrong answers. Do you know, in this country now, in the United States, uh, we're beginning to go from, a, from, a, from being a republic to a pure democracy. And we're doing this with surveys. You see, in a democracy, everybody gets to, gets to, gets to decide about everything. That's hugely dangerous. When it gets to the place where everybody gets to decide about everything, then the majority will oppress the minority. The thing that's given us liberty in this country is not that we were a democracy. We, we have a democratic form of government, but the thing that protects us is our laws. Huh? Because our laws protect minorities. But now we're in, we're in danger because we're basically governing now by Gallup poll. Ask the people. You say, well, I'm glad of that. Well, you'll be only glad when you're voting yes. The rest of the time they got you. Anyway, Having said all that terrible stuff about questionnaires, I did one. And this questionnaire was about not what do you know about the coming of Jesus, but how do you feel about it? You see, because I think that how we feel about things seems to be what's driving us these days. Uh, you know, how many times have I heard somebody say, I know I shouldn't do this, but... You know, that, that's crazy. I, I know every time I did it before I got in trouble. I know every time I did it before I regretted it. I know every time I did it before people said I was out of my mind. I read in the book I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. We're messing up our lives, not because of what we know, but because of how we feel. I'm going to do it no matter what. So this, question, this was a questionnaire about how do people feel about the coming of Jesus. Remember, remember the context? I'm preaching a, a class in, in the coming of Jesus. In other words, the actual event, the actual event. So my first question, and, and this is the questionnaire, my first question was, do you want Jesus to come? Now this was not a thing where you got to fill it in objectively, it was, it was check the blank. For possibilities, I put yes, no, very much, or explain. I thought by putting explain, I let you get out of the yes, no, or very much. You put something else if you want to. Anyway, before I tell you how people answered this, I want to say that I essentially ask these same questions, not only to the Sabbath school people in, in Tacoma Park, but I ask them to, the, to, to, to young teen types in South America, in Santiago, in Chile. But I, I ask them in Spanish, ¿Quieres tú que Cristo venga? Do you want Jesus to come? 
I ask these same questions huh, to a young adult class in Waganugu. If I were to say to you, I'll meet me next Thursday in Waganugu, would you know where to go? <laughs> yeah. What are they? It used to be called Upper Volta. I, I don't know what they call it now. Anyway, and, and listen, what I'm telling you this, everybody answered the same. Whether you went to Tacoma Park, South America, or West Africa, you answered the same. First question, do you want Jesus to come? Everybody says what? Yes. yes. I don't think there was one no. I think even the bad guy said yes. Because everybody said yes. In fact, some even put him, put, I want him to come very much. So far, so good. The next question was, if you could set a date for his coming, when would it be? All right, now we're separating the men from the boys and the girls from the women. So hands went up when I first did this and they said, but we don't know when he's coming. I said, I didn't say that. What's the question? If it was up to you, when would it be? Listen, I want to tell you, most everybody who answered, remember, the, they, they had all said yes, they want him to come. But most everybody who answers this question says, yes, I want him to come, but, but what? Later, down the line someplace. Now, not everybody answered down the line. Some put that they wanted him to come today. And although this doesn't have a place for, for names on it, I could tell who those people were that said him they wanted him to come today. I could tell by the way they wrote. Who is it? Who are they? They're the old people. Huh? It, down there in, in South America, I, I, I didn't ask the, the young people if you could set a date for his coming, when would it be? I said, ¿Quieres tú que Cristo venga antes que tú cases o después? Do you want Jesus to come? You're with me. You speak in Spanish, huh? Uh, do you want Jesus to come before you get married or after? The same crowd that says, yes, I want him to come. And yes, I want him to come very much. But not until after I get married. Do you know something? Many of us think in our hearts that when Jesus comes, we're going to lose something. Huh? It's true that we're going to have to give up something. Huh? I was preaching about the coming of Jesus one time, and a guy told me, he said, I want to tell you, Pastor. He told me afterwards. He says, if we don't snuggle with our wives in heaven, I don't want to go. You know, that's not the way he put it. <laughs> we got this thing in our heads. Oh, sure, if you just lost your job, if your kids are taking dope, if your husband just ran away, you're praying, oh, Jesus, please come. But when you just got a new house and a new job and you got a raise and you just got a car, you just, that'll be all right. Got some things I wanted to do. Am, am I wrong? Oh, yes. You see, you see, our feelings about the coming of Jesus and what we know about the coming of Jesus are not the same thing. When things are going bad, I want him to come. When things are going good, that'll be all right. Listen, I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I don't know. Now, some people like to argue that we will snuggle in heaven. I think Jesus was very clear. You, you don't even have to speak a Greek to know that. Jesus said we're going to be like angels. Now, you may think that's a net loss. I don't think it's a net loss. I think my kids will always be my kids, and when I, around, and Betty will always be a special friend. But, you know, see, this is the idea. The idea that the greatest thing in this life happens to be in sexual intimacy is crazy. Uh, you know, some people even say, you know, that that's where happiness in marriage begins. Is it true? It's not true. Anybody in their right mind knows that's right. If you don't have happiness in your marriage, you're not going to find happiness in no place. Especially there. Am I right or am I wrong? See, you see, the world's got it upside down. It's turned us upside down. You see, we don't even have a concept of what re real love's about. For, you, see, you see, they've taken this word. You know, in, in, in fact, when you think of how the devil's corrupted our language, I have a sermon I preach called, He, he Speaks Our Language. He, he takes words that were supposed to be words that only God talked. Now the devil talks them. You, you, you know these, you know, you know the word love, you say, you know... Uh, you know, I was just coming uh, into the house here and I saw two dogs making love. Or you know the homosexual lovers. Or I love apple pie. 
And then in the next word, we're saying, God is love. And he's going to be saying, not if that's what you mean. No, I think that, that, that even some of our, our, our closest relationships that we have here, you know, even these kids, you could say they love their parents, but, but hooked with that is, where's mommy? You know, I'm out of my mind. In other words, it's more than love. Huh? It's insecurity. It's fear. It's dependency. In heaven, we won't have those problems with relationships. I say that love in heaven is going to be something that we haven't seen. All I know is this. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know the scripture says, I has not seen or ear heard. Neither can you even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Yeah. Now, are we going to suffer some, some net losses when we get to heaven? You bet we are. There'll be no pain there. You, this boy on, on, on you, you see this young man, this young teen with a sparkle in his eye? Doesn't have a leg, but he's going to have one there. Yeah, that's why you, the wheelchair you see here, we're not going to have wheelchairs there. We're going to be young. We're going to be vigorous. There'll be no pain. He's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. If you say that's a loss, I say, I'm glad. I don't have to snuggle with my wife to make that the best thing that could ever happen. I have not seen or ear heard. No, we've got mixed feelings about the coming of Jesus. Another question that I had in this, in this uh, questionnaire was, when Jesus comes, will you be ready? And the possibilities were yes, no, I hope so, or I don't know. This person checked, I don't know. You know, there was a day, as I was mentioning earlier, in which we talked about the coming of Jesus all the time. But, 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 but you know, sometimes I think, I think that, that, that we got bored with it. I, I, I think we got bored with it for two reasons. One was we insisted on setting dates. I mentioned last night, people say to me, when do you think Jesus is coming next year? I don't know. Two years? I don't know. I hope he comes soon. I, I want to tell you something, to, you know, to, to you parents who are here. I want to say, now, you, you may think I'm just being, being a fanatic, but is, who's this you hold? Is that you, anybody I should know? I, I knew it was your granddaughter. I can tell by the way you're holding her. They're, they're, you know, you don't have to explain to your granddaughter or your grandma. She knows. Yeah. You know, I've noticed this, that little children like this, you don't have to say, I'm grandpa, be good to me. I'll be in a supermarket. And there'll be a little child, just, just in, a, in a little being pushed around, and the child looks over at me and goes, never saw me from Adam. No, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but children recognize grandpas. There's something between us. You talk about chemistry? There's chemistry between us and the kids, because they can tell a grandma or grandpa when they see it. Anyway, you know, uh, thinking of our feelings about the coming of Jesus, you know, there was a day, and some of you won't remember this day, there was a day in which we were all poor. Now, we didn't know we were poor uh, because we only had one car and the house was little. There were four of us kids. I went back and saw the house where, you know, where we were. My lens, it was the size of some kid's bedroom. Uh, I, I remember, I mean, it just wasn't, very, but we didn't feel it was a little house. Huh? We didn't have everything. You know, I can remember a day. Now, just think of it. Now, now I know you, you, the rest of you are just bored when I say this. I can remember a day, son, when, when we had two sets of clothes. School clothes and Sabbath clothes. That's all there was. That's all there was. Now, I know you, think, you kids are thinking, ooh. Oh, and, 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 and we only had two pairs of shoes. What were they? Sabbath shoes and school shoes. And in the summer, we went barefooted. Those days, we were poor, but we didn't feel poor. Uh, because, and see, this is the problem now. This is the problem now. Look in your closet. Look in your closet. Wow. You know, some people's closets are as big as a whole house. You know, just on and on and on. Uh, shoes, just dozens of pairs of shoes. When the scripture talks about a white robe, you'd say, I don't like white. You know, I just bought a new outfit last, last week. If I can't take it to heaven, I don't want to go. Shoes, you know, and all that. No, listen, I'll tell you. You see, when you don't have anything, you want Jesus to come. When you get a little bit, you want to say, it's okay. And another thing, as I mentioned before, when you set dates for it, we set dates for the coming of Jesus till the cows come home. And every time we missed, didn't we? Every time we missed. 
I think it's a mistake to keep setting dates for the coming of Jesus. You see, I think one of the problems is that maybe in a way, those who were thinking of the coming of Jesus, they were living by adrenaline. You know what that is, don't you? You know, in other words, hey man, did you hear the good news? What's that? There was a tsunami, man. 200,000 people killed. Amen. Jesus is coming. Come on now. Did you hear about the hurricanes? Oh, yes, Jesus is coming. Listen, you can't live on adrenaline like that. You can't do it because it takes a bigger and bigger shot of it. Isn't that the way it goes? So, and, 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 and so what happens is when, when the coming of Jesus has got to be something that makes you afraid and you're not afraid, then what? Who cares? Who cares? Daddy told me he was, he was a young man. That's all they talked about was the coming of Jesus. And... Uh, my daddy never thought he'd ever, he'd ever get married. He didn't want to go to college. Because he figured, for what? Wasting my time. I just want to knock on doors, tell people Jesus is coming. He never thought he'd get married and have kids, and, and he died a great grandpa. Anyway, he was telling me one time that he was out knocking on doors selling books. And he went to this door and he made his little presentation. He was a literature evangelist. And, uh, and the people said, no, thank you, you know, whatever they said. But you know what dad is going to do to them? Give them a Bible study. That's why you're not going to buy my books. You're going to get a Bible study out of the deal. And what's the Bible study going to be about? The coming of Jesus. Because that's, that, that's where they were in those days. You remember, that's where they were. Some of us remember that. You remember that? That's where they were. And, and he starts talking about the coming of Jesus to this guy. And the guy starts getting excited. And he says, come into the dining room. I got something I want to show you. And there, there in the dining room, there's the china closet, you know, where they put the dishes. And there's a big set of dishes in there. And, 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 and the guy says to my dad, see that set of dishes? My grandfather bought those from a family in 1844 who was selling everything they had. Because where they were going, the service was provided. They weren't going to need that stuff anymore. My dad kind of got excited. When, isn't that significant to see a set of dishes like that? This is, this is putting your money where your mouth is. This is putting your life, you know, where your talk is, where your faith is. And dad says, can I have one of those dishes? Guy said, yeah. He gave him one. Now, I know what you ladies are thinking. You're thinking back in those days, they didn't eat very much. That, <laughs> this, this, this was the original low carbs that's where they got that. You know what I used to think this was? I used to think this was the butter dish. You know, you put a little bit of butter. Somebody, though, told me who seems to know about those things. This was probably the salt dish. Because I remember when I lived overseas, it wasn't salt shakers in those days. It was a pile of salt. And you would reach over in the pile of salt, get a pinch, and then go to your plate and go. So that's probably a salt dish. But isn't that something? Listen, that was, this, this was from a family. A family who believed, who had the blessed hope. What happened in our church, even in these last few years, to the blessed hope? We don't talk about it anymore. Maybe, 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 it's because, maybe it's because we were afraid. Maybe it's because we were using it as a stick. You know, it's like, Jesus coming, I'm going to get you. Does that make you want to get come to Jesus? <laughs> makes you want to makes you want to want to hit the road. That's what it does. Anyway, it's fulfilling scripture because in Matthew twenty five, Jesus tells a story, and it's the story of the ten young groom grooms maids. You thought I was going to say bridesmaids, right? By the way, I used to live in South Asia. I lived in Pakistan. And in that part of the world, huh, the bride is nobody. It's the groom that's everybody. I, I was talking with a guy one time. He said he went to a wedding and the bride wasn't even there. And they went ahead and had the wedding. And then when the, when the, when the wedding was over, they went up and picked her up. Uh, I, I, I went to a wedding one time. And uh, 
And I was talking to the groom and I said, do you know the girl you're going to marry? He said, I don't know her. I've never met her. Because over there, who chooses? The parents choose. He says, I've never met her. He says, I saw her from a distance. She looks all right. Anyway, it came time for the wedding. It came time for the wedding and they brought her in and she was co covered with a sheet from the top of her head to the soles of her feet without eye holes. So they had to lead her in. Huh? And when I saw her coming in like that, covered with a sheet, I wanted to say, Jacob, look out. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, that's not who you think under that sheet. But, uh, but anyway, anyway, over in that part of the world, it's that way. It's, it's grooms. It's the groom. So these were groomsmaids. These ten young girls uh, were waiting for the groom. How many went to sleep? Uh, you fell for that. It's everybody goes to sleep. I think that's what's happened to us, ladies and gentlemen, in this last generation or two. Uh, our forefathers, my father, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and his people, this church was based on the coming of Jesus. I think, to some large extent, we've lost the blessed hope, because we don't talk about it anymore. We're we talk about what's interesting to us. We're not talking about that, unless it be like this. So they all went to sleep, but while they slept, Jesus tells the story, something happened. Because when they woke up, they weren't the same. Five of them had run out of what? And what does it all represent? In other words, the Holy Spirit is something in your head. So, so, so finally, finally, when the word gets out, Jesus is, Jesus is here, or, or the bridegroom comes, five of them, what they, what they need, they don't have. And the, and the first thing they did was say, give us what you got. What's the point? You can't. Whatever it is, you can't give it to somebody. You either got it or you don't. And you see, this is another thing. Now listen to what I'm about to say, young people particularly. There are some people, uh, ad, let's say Adventists, because that's what we are. Some Adventists think, well, I know I'm not what I ought to be. But you know, when they have the Sunday law, man, I'm going to get really religious. <laughs> I'm going to start reading my Bible and everything and praying probably even a little bit and I'm going to really change my life, you know, when the Sunday law comes. I think they're in for a surprise. Um, because really, really fear can't change your heart. Uh, fear can take you to Jesus, but it'll never keep you there. And so we've got to understand, and this is what scares me a lot these days, that while Jesus uh, is apparently not coming, now remember this, I could get into another discussion, I don't want to upset you. Remember, the scripture says he's appointed a day. Uh, in, when Jesus tells stories about the delay of the coming, it's a perceived delay. In other words, he didn't come when they expected him to come. It's, in other words, he didn't come because he didn't know when he was going to come. Let, let, let me just say something here, and, and, and this could be another subject. Uh, when the disciples asked Jesus to tell us, tell them when he was going to come, what did he tell them? He said, my father's the only one who knows. Did, did he say that or didn't he? He said, my father knows. In other words, his father knew the day and the hour 2,000 years ago, right or wrong? Okay, now you see, here's where I get a little confused then. Because we say that Jesus will come when we get ready. Which this, this means what? Huh? That would mean he doesn't know. Because it means it's up to who? See the trick on that? When Jesus comes, his people will be ready. I want to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. There are people who will be ready for the coming of Jesus, whether you're ready or not. That's the thing. See, when I got on that plane yesterday, guess what? It was going without me. That's the point. This idea that Jesus isn't going to come until I give the signal, let's go, is a delusion. He comes when you're not even thinking about it. So that's why he says, that he doesn't even say get ready, he says what? And this is where it begins to get a little complicated. Because you remember what I said in that little survey I took. I asked the question, when Jesus comes, will you be ready? Most of the people answered, guess what? I hope so, or what? I don't know. What's this telling us? Something big. How can the coming of Jesus be the blessed hope? You know what that means? If you feel when he comes, you're going to be lost. 
or if you feel you don't even know how it's going to end up. How can you be looking forward to that? I think that our attitude toward the coming of Jesus is being affected by this last question. Why should we be telling the world that Jesus is coming when we're thinking, yeah, right. I hope not. Isn't this true? Come on, isn't it true? But then, but, and, and, and here's where I'm coming from. Now hang on, hang on, because this, this is going to be a little rough. I think that if somebody asks us, when Jesus comes, will you be ready? We must be able to say yes. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I'm not a Baptist. I mean, if you say yes to that, that means you believe one saved all. No, it doesn't. And, well, that means you think you're perfect. I mean, that thinks you've... No, it doesn't. If we don't say yes to that question, we have no blessed hope. If we're going to... When Jesus comes, will you be ready? I hope so. I don't know. We're in trouble. We've got to say yes to that. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm not perfect. Listen, listen, stay with me and see if you can figure this. I say we must say yes to this based on this. I know in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've delivered to him. Mason, I feel we must say yes to that because, why aren't you on the front row? You're supposed to be on the front row. Oh, you're sitting back there. Bring the buddy up to the front row for the next meeting. Listen, we must say yes to that huh? because he who has begun this work in us is promised to finish it. Huh? You, see, you, see, you see, it isn't something that we work into. You can't prepare yourself, but the Holy Spirit prepares us. The oil is the Holy Spirit. And so, and, and, so, and so what we've got to do is to pray for the infilling of the Holy Ghost, for the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and an ongoing every day. You know, you know I want to tell you something. I told you about how old I am and everything. Uh, you know, I could show you pictures back when I was young. And you can say, is that you? No, that's not me. Well, who is it then? This is me. Are you hear where I'm coming from? Let me tell you who we are today. I am now. I'm not yesterday or tomorrow. I'm only now. Am I right or wrong on that? I'm only now. In other words, giving my heart to Jesus. Can I give my heart to Jesus yesterday? No, it's finished. Can I give my heart to Jesus tomorrow? No, it's never come. When can I give my heart to Jesus? Only now. Huh? When can I be ready for the coming of Jesus? Yesterday? I can't be ready. Yesterday? Can I be ready tomorrow? It never comes. When then am I ready for the coming of Jesus? Now. How am I going to do that? I may be oversimplifying this. This may not be very deep. I just think that being ready for the coming of Jesus is give your heart to Jesus. Make your commitment. Get on the knees in the morning and say, Jesus, I'm your girl. I'm your boy. Well, does what's that mean? You're perfect or something? You mean you think you arrived? You don't send him? No, but it means I know in whom I believe. Ask the Apostle Paul. You're going to be ready when Jesus comes. He says, I know there's a crown for me. We've got to be able to say the same. He who has begun this work in me will finish it. It does not yet appear what we will be, but he's committed. Understand that. You give your heart to Jesus. If, if with all our hearts we seek him, we'll find it. If we'll give our hearts to Jesus, he who has begun this work in us will finish it. And if that's the case, when Jesus comes, we'll be re will we be ready? What's the answer to that? The answer is yes. And then when we get that in our hearts, we're gonna, when Jesus comes, we're going to receive him. We're going to go to heaven. Then we're going to be able to tell, the, tell anybody. Oh, I hope Jesus comes. When do you hope he comes? I hope he comes today. Now, I know there's a problem, and that's our children. And you know, I heard one mother say to me one time, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. She said, if my children are in heaven, I don't want to go. That's really sweet. But I'm going to tell you, don't misunderstand me. i got four children, eight grandchildren. I'm going to heaven whether they go or not. Amen. You understand me? Does that mean I don't love them? I'm going anyway. Because I've got a heavenly daddy. I owe it to him to be there. You understand what I'm saying. I'm going to have an altar call now. It's not going to be an altar call where you come forward. It's just, I'm going to start here with the elder back in the back. Mason, I picked up. He's the only name I know here. Is the rest of you named Mason too? 
You're not all named Mason, are you? So I can only talk to Mason, Elder. When Jesus comes, will you be ready? Yes. What about it, Grandma? Yes. Yes. What about it, my friend? Yes. yes. And what about the couple here sitting here? What about this? You're younger people. Have you thought about that before? Son, when Jesus comes, will you be ready? Yes. What about it, pastor's wife? Yes. What about it, Caleb? Come on up. Come up here and stand by me a minute. Come up here and stand by me. He's got to put his book down and everything. He was just reading them. He was reading it, not listening probably, but I think he was listening. <laughs> I, I think he was reading out of one ear and listening out of the other. Honey, when Jesus comes, will you be ready? Yeah. Well, then why don't we stand? When Jesus comes by his grace, he who has begun the work will finish it. It doth not yet appear what we will be, but we know when he appears, we're going to be like him because we've given our hearts to him. He who's begun the work will finish it. Why don't we sing about the blessed hope as our kind of our commitment altogether? What would you say? Let's sing, we have this hope that burns within our hearts. Start it up, start it up there. It's 214, isn't it? Yes, 214. 214, start it up. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. Uh, let's. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.org or you can call us at 616-676-3705. You can also write us at P.O. Box 752, ADA, that's A-D-A, -A, Michigan. 49301. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.org.